we're now going to discuss an equally important aspect of the home ownership journey, hiring a competent attorney. Time and time again, we hear persons say they either weren't aware that they required an attorney or intend to handle the transaction on their own or sincerely believe that because they're accessing financing through the NHG, that the NHG's legal team would be at their disposal and that's not how it works. For most persons, the purchase of a home will be one of their largest financial decisions. As a result, the importance of wholly protecting such an investment cannot be overstated. We see and hear the stories daily of individuals who experience very costly hiccups. So having legal counsel makes the process smoother and ensures your interests are protected. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Ms. Camille Chavans, our Assistant General Manager, Legal Conveyancing and Mortgage Registry. And as I've termed her, or conveyancing with to the conversation. So as I said, time and time again, persons either say that they'll handle the transaction on their own because a part of pursuing home ownership is hiring an attorney. They see the fee and they said, oh no, mm -hmm. I'll do otherwise. I can manage it. How hard can it be? But you, more than any, you know, more than myself or probably anybody watching or any other attorney will know the importance or the value of hiring representation Tell me though, what is the role for those persons who still want to do it on their own? What's the role of your attorney in the process? All right. Thanks, Danielle, mm -hmm. for having me. And it's a very important area, particularly for our contributors who are accessing a loan to purchase. So what is the role of an attorney? Now, remember that the acquisition of whether it's land, whether it's a house, an apartment, is a contractual relationship. And every contract has terms and conditions. Now, many persons feel that, well, you know, I, I think I can get by on my own. The agreement seems reasonable. I'm sure I can rely on the vendor's attorney to uh, look out for me. And what I would say to, to all prospective purchasers is while there is no law that says you must be represented by an attorney, the fact of the matter is that an attorney can really only represent one client to the very best of their ability. And so when something goes wrong is when you discover why you should have an attorney mm. of your own, because the vendor's attorney is going to be looking out for the vendor. And so that's the first point. You really want somebody who represents your interests. You also want someone who is going to vet the agreement for sale for any terms that might be particularly prejudicial to you as the purchaser. You also want the attorney who is representing you to walk you through the whole process of the acquisition of the property. That might include not only vetting the agreement for sale, but doing a title search. Is the person who is selling really authorized to sell? Uh, <laughs> oh. um, the, the, the purchaser's attorney also guides you through some of the requirements that you will have to meet in terms of accessing financing, whether from the NHD or any other financial institution. And so it's important that you have someone to represent you, particularly if you do not reside in Jamaica, you don't understand Jamaican law, you don't understand the processes that guide a sale, they're not the same as they are in other areas. And so having someone in Jamaica to guide you through that process really is ideal. And the other thing too, when you speak about competence, is you also need to be sure that you select someone who is above board, licensed to practice, mm -hmm has some experience in conveyancing law. Um, while all attorneys, I'm sure, could guide you through the process, there are those who are experienced in conveyancing law, so they know some of the pitfalls that perhaps uh, attorneys who practice in other areas of the law may not be so okay with. So, I think I've outlined most of the reasons why, mm -hmm. and the good reasons why, and even more importantly, the lawyers at the NHD do not represent the purchaser. The lawyers at the NHT represent the National Housing Trust. It's our job to look out for the NHT's interests by securing the loans, by giving advice to the institution. And while we do try to look out for our, our customers or mm -hmm. our purchasers, really our obligation is to the National Housing Trust. And, you know, I let out a sigh when you had said that it's the job you know of your attorney to do a title search mm -hmm. to ensure that the vendor is authorized 
I am not an attorney and I see this so very often, Mm -hmm. whether it is on social media Mm -hmm. or any other media platform. And you see it in, uh, you know, news sometimes where persons, multiple persons have bought the same property. Correct. And it could have been prevented because these hiccups could have been prevented as they're costly hiccups and it could have been prevented if there was competent legal representation. I would cannot stress it enough, especially if you're overseas, you don't know the laws of the land, hire somebody who does. And I just want to jump from that now, uh, Ms. Chevans, we've discussed the role, but so what can somebody expect? Betty, what can a, a, a purchaser expect throughout the process? You know, what does the conveyancing process involve? They have now hired the attorney that, you know, somebody is watching this. They said, let me jump on it. Let me hire my attorney. They've done their due diligence. They've checked it. They've gotten referrals. They're now assured that this person will represent their best interest. What can that person expect during the conveyancing process? You know, what kind of agencies would be involved? What, What does the paperwork look like? All right, so typically for purchases in Jamaica, it's the documentation is in writing. So you have a contract that is prepared typically by the vendor's attorney. Mm-hmm. And that contract is then sent to the purchaser's attorney or to the purchaser if they're unrepresented for execution and return with the deposit. Once the vendor signs, you now have a contract. So the contract doesn't come into existence until... Both parties have signed and the deposit is paid. That's the general Mm -hmm. um, starting point. Now, in anticipation of of executing that agreement, you may need other documents. So, for example, you're purchasing. You're going to need a valuation report. Why do you need a valuation report? You want to know that the amount that you are expending to acquire the land is equal to, ideally, or less than the market value and why is that important because most financial institutions base financing on the purchase price or the market value whichever is less right so if you are purchasing property for more than it's worth you will have to find that difference out of pocket and that's critical and that's important Mm -hmm. and so the valuation report is prepared by what we call valuation surveyors they are trained in Mm -hmm. um, making determinations about market value insurance value replacement cost in relation to the property you're hoping to Mm -hmm. purchase another important document is the surveyors identification report and that's prepared by commissioned land surveyors also very important what that report does is make a comparison between the description of the property you're acquiring on land as opposed to what is how it is described in the title and that's important because you want to ensure that you're getting good title and by good title we mean no discrepancies in the boundaries we mean no breaches of restrictive covenants and you may say what's a restrictive covenant a restrictive covenant is a list of rules that say what you can and you cannot do we're here in this beautiful apartment one of the restrictive covenants could be do not hang your washing outside right. your window um, do not change the color of the apartment why do they exist restrictive covenants are meant to promote harmonious living maintain the value and the aesthetic of a, mm-hmm. of a development in most instances it also speaks to setbacks from the boundaries because you want air you want light around you so those are some of the restrictive covenants that are imposed on many titles and what this commission land survey will do is make a comparison between those covenants as listed in the title and what actually exists on ground so that you know whether the the title is good title there's also an issue of encroachment and an encroachment as distinct from a breach of a restrictive covenant now means you have taken up land that does not belong in the title It has other implications Mm -hmm. um, for legal action sometimes, and it can interfere with your ability to access a loan. So those are some of the documents that you're going to need as part and parcel of the process of acquiring property. And that is, those are some of the the documents that your attorney now will guide you to acquiring. So they will tell you title search, 
that which they will mm -hmm. do, and that is at the National Land Ages Titles Division. Now, I don't know if many persons know, but titles are held in what we call duplicate. So the original remains at the titles office, and what the financial institution or purchaser who buys cash gets is what is called a duplicate. I'd like for you to repeat that point. Your title is held in duplicate. All right. Mm -hmm. So each certificate of title issued under the Registration of Titles Act is issued in duplicate. The original remains at the titles office, mm -hmm. and the duplicate is what either the financial institution or the purchaser gets if it's a cash purchase. Okay. And the idea is that what is reflected on the duplicate is what is on the original. But there are instances when notations made on the duplicate do not reach the original. And then we are going now into oh, yes. the area of, <laughs> of other matters. Right. <laughs> See, but suffice it, to say, yes. suffice it to say, that's one of the reasons you do a title search, because you want to know what the original title says, not the duplicate. Oh. So that's the importance of the title search. So the, you may have a duplicate that says, Daniel is the registered proprietor. Yes. But when you do a search of the original, the title is the name of Brian. Right. First thing your attorney is going to ask, why is that? That means there needs to be some nexus between Brian and Daniel mm -hmm. if you are selling. And so those are some of the questions that your attorney will interrogate to determine whether, in fact, Daniel is appropriately trying mm -hmm. to dispose of the property. Well, come here. This is such... A, I know we have, you know, a few more questions to go, but this is such valuable information because a lot of time you do not know what you really need to know until you're in the throes of the process, until you're in the midst of the process and it is costing you. And you say, boy, if I knew, if I knew this, then I would have pursued it differently. Mm -hmm. I would have operated differently. I would have acted differently. And real estate hiccups that cost you, cost you big. Right. It's not... It's not a little bit of, it costs you big, particularly when it comes to things like interest. So for example, if you've agreed to complete the sale within a particular mm -hmm. time and it goes beyond that agreed timeline, then you can accumulate something called interest and all of that. But boy, as I say, higher competent representation. No, right, Camille, so you were saying valuation ID, survey ID survey report, identification valuation report. report. Mm -hmm. Right, so those are some of the documents that you're going to need in any event, whether you're accessing a loan or not, just mm -hmm. for your own satisfaction that you're getting what you're paying right. for. And for financial institutions, NHT requires those documents to facilitate processing for a loan. All right, so what is the process then? Generally speaking, once the document has been signed, uh, the deposit paid, that's the start of the transaction. You now then have an obligation now to show to the vendor's attorney, how are you going to complete the sale? Do you have cash in your bank that can cover the costs? Or are you getting a loan? If you have money in the bank, it will be an undertaking from the bank to the vendor's attorney to say we commit to pay X amount to complete this transaction. If you are getting a loan now from a financial institution, the NHD, for example, if you're coming to us for a loan, will issue what is called a letter of commitment. And really all that says to you and to anyone you present it to is, we have approved whatever the sum of money is for this particular person, and we commit to pay it. You will take that then to the vendor's attorney so they know, okay, person has the money. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing that is, happens is a letter of undertaking is issued now by the National Housing Trust if we are the financier. And that letter of undertaking is directed to the vendor's attorney, right? Uh, typically, uh, once the agreement for sale is signed, it's stamped. It has to be stamped to government duties. That's not determined by the National Housing Trust. It's not de determined by the vendor or the purchaser. Mm -hmm. That's determined by the government. And so government duties are, have to be paid on those conveyancing transactions. So it has to be stamped. That's what gives it validity. Uh, once the vendor's attorney now has the undertaking from the financial institution, which usually says we will pay whatever the amount is in the letter of commitment on the receipt of certain documents, on registration of those documents, then we will disperse our loan proceeds. So uh, once the vendor's attorney gets that, they're satisfied that there is enough funds to complete the transaction, they rely now on the undertaking, whether from the financial institution or the bank, 
they will then send the relevant documents to facilitate registration. Now, what are those documents? Mm -hmm. You need a transfer. So remember, we spoke about the contract agreement for yes, sale. Yes. All right. Because now we have to endorse that interest on that title that we spoke mm -hmm. about, both the original and the duplicate, an instrument of tr transfer has to be prepared and executed by all the parties. That is then cross-stamped. And by cross-stamped, we mean it's presented again to the government agency, which is TAG, to verify that the duties were appropriately paid. And that's noted on that instrument. So the vendor's attorney will send the transfer. They will send the duplicate certificate of title, if it's in their possession. Uh, discharges of any mortgages which may have been endorsed on the title on behalf of the vendor, the appropriate registration fees, and any other documents that might be relevant to facilitate the transfer. On receipt of those documents, now the National Housing Trust, uh, in order to register their mortgage, is going to lodge those documents, so the transfer, our mortgage, and the title, which is a mm -hmm. duplicate, at the title's office. When it is registered, an entry is made both on the duplicate and on the original. Oh. Correct, so you're gonna see an endorsement right. as to the transfer and as to the mortgage, both on the original held at the title's office mm -hmm. and on the duplicate certificate of title. When those come back, now that's the basis on which now we are able to disperse because mm -hmm. ownership has now passed to the purchaser once it has passed, it's no time to pay the proceeds to the vendor's attorney. Once the vendor's attorney has right. been paid, then assuming there are no other outstanding sums due, the purchaser is given possession of the property. So I've seen that in a very general sense right. how the transaction works. Mm -hmm. um, you may be wondering why a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Okay, a mortgage is how a financial institution secures the funds that they lend to a purchaser. And it's the, it's the easiest way of, of granting funds. Why? Because in the event of default, that mortgage instrument, once registered, enables the financial institution to exercise what we call recovery of sale. Right. Po exercise pause of sale by way of selling the property mm -hmm. so we can recoup the funds. So I, I hope I've covered. I it, it, so it, it, it can be. It's a lot. I, I know. <laughs> and that's one of the so reasons why you, why you mm -hmm. need an attorney Good to kind of guide you through yes. that process. So I really want to emphasize that while you may not be required in law to have one, it really is advisable to have somebody who can walk you through those steps. Right. So that when you, you know, there's a lot of anxiety involved in purchasing properties, a lot of money that you're expending, especially now. Mm -hmm. And it's a financial obligation. Right which you are now entering into with a financial institution. So you want to make sure that as far as possible, you do everything to get it right. Right. And, and, and you want to ensure that, as you said, this is a big purchase. You don't want to incur any additional cost no, other than you've budgeted for. Correct. Because that can really, really put a halt on it. But, you know, saying all of that, are there any tips or any general advice you know apart from, you've given a wealth of information but any advice based on your expertise that you've observed that you really think that those persons who are investing from overseas need to be aware of they need to do they need to observe is, is, is there any advice that you'd have all right a couple of things that i would say um firstly uh referrals are always great but i would suggest you do your own homework as well you can check the General Legal Counsel's website to find attorneys who are um, certified to practice. Right. Uh, you can also check with the Real Estate Board to see if the valuation surveyor is entitled to, to perform those services. You can check with the Land Surveyors Association for their commission land surveyors. So that's one of the things I would do, double yes. check, right? Um, the second thing I would say is um, be aware that um, although you may reside in Massachusetts, <laughs> uh, the laws of Massachusetts don't govern the right. purchase of land in Jamaica. The other thing is um, some of the requirements for execution of documents. For example, if you're overseas, they have to be witnessed by a notary public. And that's not a requirement of the institution, it's a requirement of the National Land Agency. Okay. So those are some of the things. So if you wonder why documents have to be coming to you, you have to execute them and send them by a courier. That's one of the reasons. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, if at all possible, 
and you're purchasing land, try to see the land. I mean, yes, you can look at a, a valuation report, but you kind of want to see it for yourself to see if it meets your needs. Um, and um, just be mindful that you are, you are in a contract. So the terms and conditions of the contract are what are operable. While through your attorney, you might seek to um, amend them up front before you sign. Or if something goes horribly wrong and it's nobody's fault, um, mm -hmm. your attorney can seek to um, negotiate with the vendor's attorney um, to provide you with some relief if you really find yourself in a predicament. Um, be aware that some things just take time. Um, submission of documents to the gov government agencies for stamping can take some time. There's kind of no control over that. And they be prepared that they may also do their own valuation report. So even though you're purchasing a property for mm -hmm. 10 million, it might be assessed at 15. Uh, the contract will speak with how right. that is treated. But those are some of the things that I think you would need to be aware of. Such valuable information. Thank you. Ms. Chavans, that's Ms. Camille Chavans, Assistant General Manager, Legal Conveyancing and Mortgage Registry. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, everything that you need to know about becoming an NHT contributor, as well as those key things to note when investing in property in Jamaica. Do the required research and take the necessary steps to prepare. And before you know it, you'll be turning your own set of keys. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, everything you need to know about becoming an NHT contributor, as well as those key things to note when investing in property in Jamaica. Do the required research and take the necessary steps to prepare. And before you know it, you'll be turning your very own set of keys. For more information on the registration process, you can contact Damien and his team by email at compliance at nht.gov.jm or give us a call at 876-929-6500. Keep the conversation going with your family and friends and share this information with them. You can also follow the NHG on all social media platforms. And that's it for us. Remember, whoever you are and wherever you are, home awaits.